Welcome to the podcast where ordinarily we take something old, a Doctor Who story from the original series, compare it with something new, one from the new series, and add something borrowed to make something Who. Well, we did that last month with The Edge of Destruction and The Doctor's Wife, and now we're back with something of a companion to that piece. Hello, I'm Richard, and this is Something Who podcast episode 72. And with me is science and astronomy writer Giles. Hi, Giles. Hello. Hello. How are you? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, good. Just back from holiday, so, uh, you know, fairly bright. Excellent. And we've got a special guest this time, so it's a big hello to Steve Manfred. Hello. Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep that going. Yeah, I, I, I did I hear he, someone else saying that the other day. <laughs> I do, not to not to me, but um, but yeah, I thought okay, yeah. it's not too late. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know; we might materialize in ancient Rome when the year began in March. Ah, true. Oh, yes. yeah. And we're all up there now. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, welcome to something. Who, Steve? Great to have you on. Perhaps you could introduce yourself to listeners of the podcast. Well, I am a long-time Doctor Who fan since 1982 living in West Central Wisconsin, USA. And I had the good fortune to be a geographically physician close to Neil Gaiman when he lived here. <laughs> and I became his go-to person for, at first, for him being able to see the new Doctor Who at all because we didn't have it for the first year on a network here. Uh -huh. So I, I was his, uh, he called me his dealer. <laughs> <laughs> we would meet in, in dark places so of our restaurants happily between us and between me or his personal assistant Lorraine and hand over a disc that uh, had files that might have come from a torrent. I think the statute of limitations is run on this now so we get a date. <laughs> we were sharing files. We were doing some file sharing so that he could see the, the new Doctor Who episodes. Yeah. And in a timely fashion, not get spoiled as, it, mm. as he would. Yeah. Missed out by one hour when the master was revealed in series three. That was a bit Ooh. of a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, did he? He got spoiled for it. Uh... They had plastered it all over the website. The master is back, and he had accidentally glanced at that one hour before I got there. With the oh, exactly. <laughs> so he knew that was coming. Yeah. But then I also did a little behind-the-scenes connection between him and the writing team, the incoming writing team on Doctor Who, mm -hmm. and got them talking to each other and got them to the point where they, they wanted to write for... Originally for Series 5, or the episode that eventually became The Doctor's Wife in Series 6, and then also mm -hmm. again in Series 7, we had Nightmare and Silver. Mm -hmm. And during the writing process, I was sort of a, 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 under the table, clandestine, extra, unofficial, almost not quite script editor <laughs> on his end of things, especially when it came to continuity points, especially in Doctor's Wife. There was a lot of that that he wanted to put in, and his own memory was faded enough that he, he needed to know again, uh, yeah. what he should be looking at again, what stories to look at again. Sometimes I was applying classic series episodes that maybe weren't on DVD yet, things like that, mm. and give the research material so you could do it himself. Or if you just had a one-off question, he'd ring me up or email me and, and ask, like, is there a good vacation spot they were always trying to get to that I can say at the end of the show? Well, they were always trying to get to the eye of Orion for the longest time. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that wound up in the, in the show, things like yeah. that. And it just continued on from there. And we still, yeah, yeah. we're still in fairly, well, it's got a lot less, uh, he's so busy with other things at the moment, the show running mm -hmm. his own show, like he's full showrunner on Good Omens, and he's a executive producer on Sandman for Netflix. And he's, he's so occupied with that, he's not able to do much in the way of, of Doctor Who stuff these, these days. Although he did do, when the world shut down, he did contribute a story about the Corsair, this, I'm uh -huh. holding up for the podcast as I'm holding up the Doctor Who Adventures of Lockdown uh -huh. short story yeah. collection that happened when Emily Cook was doing all the tweet alongs during uh, yeah. in 2020. And yeah, so there's a story about the Corsair that anytime he does write something like that, a short story for some collection or other, he will let me know it's coming and maybe uh, double check the Dado's facts right and suggest something else also you could throw in there. So we still talk <laughs> in, the, in that way. Sure. Ah, if only some of the um, some of the other writers were so assiduous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I've I've been a fan for a very long time, but uh, you know, and it's all in there. But I mean, 
even then sometimes when we're we're talking about something on this or if i'm doing a preparation i'm i'm you know i have a flick in the internet just to make sure that my memory is correct i mean mostly it is but there's, there's the odd time when you know something will be slightly different from where i remember it so uh, you know I, I can understand why even if you're 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 a big fan you might it might be helpful to have someone like you steve just to set set you set uh, set you right yeah and that that kind of research has become so much easier these days whereas what at the time he was writing dr wife a lot of it was that you didn't have writ box yet where you could just pick out any single word mm. out of any story to stitch them together and form the lyrics to Ra Ra Rathati. <laughs> as we've seen happen lately. Yeah, everyone can do that now. Then you couldn't yet. You still needed someone with an encyclopedic knowledge. And I, mm -hmm. I developed one of those during the 1980s when there was so much Doctor Who would be broadcast in my area. I was getting three entire stories a week most of the time. <laughs> the whole of my early teens because I was situated yeah. between two two PBS stations, one of them from Minnesota, one from Wisconsin, and they were showing so much Doctor Who between them that it all went in here, kind of a classic yeah. series, and it just it stayed there. So is is that the classic story then of you know the American fan that it's, it's nearly all Tom Baker, or was it was it more what um, varied than that? It started out like that. It was Tom Baker reruns to begin with, but then it eventually turned into uh, they they ran through every Doctor. They ran, they ran every complete story. We saw the 17 Arnolds, the, at the time, five Troutons, and they usually did them in, we called it movie form, you would call it omnibus, where they would yeah. you stitch all the episodes of the, of the story together and, and form a movie and then show that in, in one late night slot when the time slots were more flexible. Or, uh, in the Wisconsin case, they would do it Sunday afternoons, so that if the four partners were usually 90 minutes, but sometimes it'd be 95 if the cliffhanger reprieve were short. Or, Maybe only, I think, Leisure High only comes to about 73 minutes clipping a reprise for so long. <laughs> and, they fast forwarded to the Brighton Beach. Yeah, they <laughs> couldn't do that, yes. <laughs> but they didn't. Yeah. And I think on Megloss, they even once, they it was so short, they repeated the chronic hysteresis part one extra time just to make it longer. <laughs> <laughs> or they just didn't quite understand how they should stitch that, that together when, at episode mm -hmm. one and two. And it also coincided with my family getting our first VCR. So I'd start recording them and then watching yeah, them whenever yeah. I wanted during the mi middle of the week. It, as long as I had tape for it. I mean, it was, that, it was that case of, you know, the tape were very expensive. You had to keep your recording over things. But I do still have a lot of the off air that have, I eventually survived in a closet upstairs. Hmm. It's interesting you're saying about with, with the DVDs, not even, yeah, you know, when you, you think, okay, I guess we're looking back at. 2008, 9, 10 kind of period. And, and yeah, you forget we were only about halfway through the DVD yeah. releases and a lot of the VHSs had already were being delisted. So it's hard to remember that it's quite that recently that a lot of the stuff wasn't available. Right. There was, there was an example of that that applies to Doctor's Wife. And it being one of the things I wanted to mention when I listened to the Your Doctor's Wife podcast and re listened again a couple of days ago, it makes me notice. Wanted to interject the things that you, that, or I, I, I know the answer to this. You know, you know, anyway, which is what, why we're talking today. The question came up about the message queue. Yes, yeah. yeah. And how that got in there. And Neil had written a foreword for a novel that Kim Newman wrote. I can't remember the title now, but it was it was this higher end novel series of hardbacks that came out near, towards that. the towards the tail end of the wilderness years. Right. Yeah. He had Neil David my favorite and wrote an introduction to that where he talked about how exciting the war, he, war game was. He hadn't seen it since it first mm. aired, but he remembered a few things about the war games. And he also said in there, I, I don't think it would be good for me as an adult to see it again now. <laughs> Probably wouldn't hold up, he thought. And I, and I finally read that thing after I, after I got to know Neil. And I went, oh, no, no, war games holds up. You should yeah, see yeah. this. <laughs> and it wasn't out on DVD yet. So I had to make one, a copy for him to see, and mm. give that to him. And then, sure enough, what in the very first draft of Doctor Wife, <laughs> there's the timeline message cube. <laughs> and I said, aha, he picked up on that. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but others uh, were available, and then he was able to buy his own copies. Like, when he originally told me what his idea was for an episode, which we can get into, too. And it was so TARDIS heavy, which I loved because it was the kind of story I loved as a kid. Mm. Anytime we went deep into the TARDIS or explored its capabilities more, 
I was all there for that. That was some of my favorite material. And so I would suggest, okay, here are the stories that are available. You should buy and, and rewatch yourself on your own time now. Edge of Destruction, mm-hmm. yes. Legopolis, Capture of Alva, yeah. those were the biggies. And then I also mentioned, you might want to have a look at maybe Inferno, because there's that they, they fly the console by itself. That yeah. wound up in the show. And one or two other things. Maybe did not watch the whole show, but maybe, maybe we'll just watch the scenes of it. And he did that. Yeah. Where, where, where he could, where he couldn't, I, I stepped in. Yeah, I was reminded recently that Terminus, is, there's a bit, you know, where, where the tiger suddenly sort of materialises around Terminus, I, I, I suppose. But yes, you'd, I'd forgotten all that monkeying about in the TARDIS before. Oh, of course, with the dissolving walls and stuff. Yes. And, yeah. <laughs> Terminus is a classic example of stories I used to call the dregs, which I consider the whole story to be among the worst Doctor who ever did. But it's got a cl- great first episode. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Terminus is one of those. Underworld's another one of those where I love its first episode and it just completely died. <laughs> Web planets like that. Yeah. And then they did a story in the new series with monsters called Drakes. Guess how true that Yeah. Yeah. So so how did you how did you originally make that that connection with Neil Gaiman then? Was was it because you were a particular fan of his writing or was it because you, you know you were the Doctor Who guy who could get in the stuff or was it a bit of both? Bit of both there. I was a fan of his his novels, but no, I wasn't much of a, a comic fan. Yeah. So I, I hadn't I didn't re- read Sandman until after he started doing novels. But the, the novel I connected with most was Neverwhere. Right. And there's a there's yeah. a, I remember in the Doctor Confidential when uh, Stephen Moffat's talking about Neil, and he'd he I think he'd read Neverwhere. He either, either read Neverwhere or he'd seen the show, and and Stephen mm-hmm. Moffat saying, "I think this guy's a Doctor Who fan. I can smell it <laughs> just from the." The, ambi- the the atmosphere and, and some of the plots of Neverwhere. Mm-hmm. And I had made the same conclusion before when I read it myself. I thought, wait, as indeed did Kim Newman. And that's how he got him to write the right. Kim Newman pointed out, you know, a lot of Neverwhere seems like it's Web of Fear. The, the whole London Underground b- business mm-hmm. there. And, and I always thought also, to an extent, maybe also the villains, Mr. Croup, Mr. Vandemar, are sort of oak and quill. Yes, yeah. Season f- I know season five and the Trout Nero made a big impression on Neil, and it kind of formed the, I need to say this, he just kind of formed the architecture of his brain, the way he thought about writing fantasy. Mind Robber's another big one, and, and that really took him off into his fantasy. Mm, uh, like right. he's, he's very proud of the fact that he and Peter Ling went to the same school. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. I think so, yes. Not at the same time, of course, but yeah. And he wasn't, he wasn't minded to go and create a long running. Motel soap opera. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. Could have gone down a hole. <laughs> ah, yes. No, yeah, the TV series in Neverwhere. I think that was... I guess I, I first encountered Neil Gaiman because he wrote the, the, Doug, the Don't Panic Douglas Adams Yes, yes, book. I read that too. And, mm, mm. and then Good Omens as well, which because I, I was a Pratchett fan. The first time I saw Neil in person was Douglas Adams was in Minneapolis doing a book signing. Mm. For mostly harmless, it was the second one he'd done. Like you've been, you've been here twice. I've been to, I went to both of these. The second one was, was a big bookstore called Dream Haven, and mm. Neil turned up and was in the line of, of people to see to see Douglas that, but we didn't talk then. Well, then I went to one of Neil's mm. book signings and, and we briefly talked that. I'd, I'd been talking to him a little bit through the frequently asked questions line that he had on the website, mm. but then w- where we really connected up was at the end of. End of 2005, going into 2006, when the Christmas Invasion airs, and we still didn't have an American network to show Doctor Who. He had seen Series 1. He'd got the Jane Goldman screenwriter, mm. had sent Neil a copy of the Series 1 DVD set, and he's got mm. a multi, he had multi-region players. And so he saw that, blogged about it, and went, aha, they got it. <laughs> mm. And then I made contact through the website again, and it's like, look, it's silly that you of all people have to see the, the episodes as they're new. Why don't I meet up with you or, or your assistant at somewhere between us, you know, which wound up being the uh, Airbu Coffee in Hudson. <laughs> and, you know, I'll give you a, a copy that I get of, of Christmas Invasion right after it airs and all the ancillary stuff that went with it, like Attack of the Grask. Mm, that was right. the title, right? Or was that the Sarah Jane one? Anyway, the, and the, the confidential that went with it. So I'd make these, that disc and then we went on with that during the, the tenancy where I'd either meet up with him Originally with clandestine sites, and then eventually we got to the plot. He just come over to the house, so I'd mm. over to the mm. house, yeah. and we just shoot the breeze about what we thought about the episodes and how good they were. 
Yes, that's something else you tend to forget in around that era was obviously you could file share on the internet, but it was kind of a long and slow business. So it, it, it wasn't the sort of thing where you just you click on a button and start watching it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so you mentioned the Douglas Adams things. I mean, in terms of Neil's era then as a Doctor Who fan, I mean, he, he mentioned, I think, on a podcast I was listening to that he had watched Hartnell, obviously Troughton, big influence. Did, I mean, did he sort of stay on? Or I mean, I guess he's getting, he's getting to be a, a teenager, I suppose, by the time Pertwee and Baker come along. He saw Pertwee. Yeah. Yeah. Quite like that, too. And certainly early Tom Baker. I'm not sure at what point his devotion faded. It might have mm-hmm. been about the time Peter Davis was started. Because by then, Neil's own, yeah, he was a, becoming an adult at this point. And, and yeah. uh, his own his own career was, was beginning to take off. He was still dipping in occasionally. But I like to say that his fandom went through a long dormant phase, which caught with, with, with the wilderness year. He didn't make much <laughs> contact with the show. When it wasn't on television, like you didn't get into any of the spin-off stuff, the, the big finish audios, the, the new adventures novels, all of that. It, that he knew it was going on, but he let it pass it by. He didn't really get back into it hard again until series one happened, and it was so good. And then he went through this period of binge watching. Yeah, he would get a lot of the classic TV because the one wasn't just himself. He wanted to show his kids, mm. the, the, the two daughters that were still living at home with him at that time, uh, Holly and, and Maddie. And it wasn't just Doctor Who. He wanted to indoctrinate them on other aspects of British culture. Like I remember, I, th- I think Maddie quite liked watching Dad's Army in one play. <laughs> yeah, I see that that a lot. So yeah, a lot, a lot of the British shows that he'd grown up on that were now available on DVD, he would get them and, and show them they mm-hmm. to the kids. The, the, the important one, especially when he wanted to procrastinate, write a book. <laughs> 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 I'm doing research. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah you can my, take the boy out of Portsmouth or Cosham, but you can't can't take the Cosham out of the boy. Yes, <laughs> yeah, but it, yeah, it woke up again big time when the news came back, and then mm-hmm. I helped, helped feed that. Feed that yeah, I mean it was kind of similar for me. I, I, I think. I mean, I I did pick up on Big Finish, you know, around about the turn of the millennium, but but my fandom went into sort of shut down for about a decade between the you know, throughout the 90s although Giles mm-hmm. I think I mean that was probably one of your more active periods I was a bit later because I was organizing conventions and stuff in the in the early 90s doing you know around, around 93 but then I had my yeah I I had my, <laughs> I had my dormant period where basically after the TV movie I kind right. of went went off the boil I just thought well it's had, it had its chance to come back sadly didn't happen okay I suppose that about wraps it up and got rid of a load of stuff that I never regret getting rid of. <laughs> Me, I I never went dormant. I could because at the same same time, this the series did the trail off. The new adventures that all started. Mm-hmm. I, I yep. started reading those, and then at the same time, I found the internet. Yeah, just the Usenet news group. For record, I thought mm-hmm. I was a big regular on that, and there was still a lot of fan discussion going on there, and rumors going on first about like the dark dimension. That yeah. well, we're going to get a 30th oh, anniversary yes. show in 1993, and of course that didn't happen. It, and <laughs> uh, and then the TV movies started wrapping up, and uh, mm. Jean Marc Lafcier uh, contacted us, was telling us what was happening with the production and all mm. all that sort of thing. And then the TV movie happened, and we thought, are we going to get a series? I mean, we're getting maybe not. Were, were the ratings good enough? Well, maybe I'll rerun it once, and it'll do better uh, on the rerun. Is the rerun going to happen? Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then, too long after that, big finish began. Yeah. Mm. And but the, and also at this point, I was old enough and just enough to be able to, to go to what conventions there were still here. They were usually wrapped in the other general science fiction. Mm. And Chicago TARDIS was going, then right. starting in '99. I would go to that regularly. Oh uh, yeah, but I can remember where I was. The day in 2003 that we we got the news that uh, Russell T Davis would bring the show back, I had just I was in my apartment, not where I am now, uh, but just a couple blocks down the road here, and I just had to move all of my furniture into my kitchen because the landlord was going to replace all the carpets. So there I am, surrounded by everything I owned in my kitchen, and I, I, I managed to get the computer hooked up again and and. The first thing I see on the Gallifrey based new, uh, the sorry the Gallifrey one news page of the one mm. was the the announcement that the show, the show was back. I went, wow, <laughs> <laughs> and it was so surreal because it had been a miserable day moving everything, uh-huh. yeah. and then there that ha- happened and it was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it couldn't have been a bigger shock. I think at that period. I mean, I, I think 
Well, c- certainly, as far as I was concerned, it, it, you know, there'd been so many false dawns mm. that, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it never seemed very likely. And then, yeah, uh, amazing that, that it became such a big success. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So in terms of the, of the Doctor's Wife, then, as, as you say, it was originally intended for Series 5. I was listening to Neil Gaiman on, on David Tennant's podcast earlier today just to sort of try and get a little bit of background. He, he mentioned that the, that, the, that, the, that the money ran out. I, d- I don't know how, how true that is. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. They originally started talking about doing it before Moffat had been announced. Okay. You said you bridged, you made a connection. Yeah, um, that goes back to the Gallifrey One forums. Uh, Stephen Moffat was there mm, yep. during the David Tennant years. He was talking yes, about yeah. that. <laughs> And I would basically collate anything he said that was interesting to Neil and email Neil with what he said. So it was kind of one way at that point. But then the Hollywood writers' strike of 2007 happened. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing this list of the companies that they were striking against. And Neil being a, a member of the Directors Guild East in America was honoring the strike and had shut down any work he was doing with at that time as and one of the listed companies was BBC Worldwide Americas. And I thought, oh, but Stephen Moffat is also doing stuff, stuff in the States. He's got to be a member of the, of the Writers Guild here, too. Hmm. But he's still writing for, for Doctor Who and whatever else he was doing at the time in Britain. And I thought, wait a minute. Are you sure you should still be working on that, Stephen Moffat? Because there's this strike happening. Hmm. And I wind up being this go-between between the two of them, discussing <laughs> whether or not they should be on strike. And that was kind of the first contact they ever had was, was that whole discussion. And that eventually turned out they were fine the way they were was because residency, where you are and where you, mm-hmm. what, what your citizen does and all that, that all figured into it. And then eventually the strike was so too. But then the, at the Gallifrey One Convention that followed directly on, so this would have been February of 08, I guess. Now, I had already heard a different but very well-connected grapevine a few months before this that Stephen Moffat was going to be taking over the show. Right. But it wasn't announced yet, and he was still a guest of Gallifrey mm-hmm. One that year. I, mm-hmm. I can remember uh, sitting, sitting directly behind him in a video room where he's doing a commentary with Arnold Blumberg on Blake. Live commentary in the room, and mm-hmm. he said something or other about, yeah, well, next year we'll have to get a bigger room, because it was it was overflowing out, out into the... Mm-hmm hallway where you have to be on the main stage and i'm standing right behind him i took great effort for will not to say yeah right you're not going to be here next year you're going to be running the show. <laughs> i knew that and he didn't know that i knew that mm, right but then I, I made a point of dropping hits to both him and to paul cornell who was also there that year in the lobby when, when he didn't wander up to people is dropping hints that neil gaiman was loving the show and that he was interested in maybe writing for it Mm-hmm. Then I knew, okay, I know these two might be on the same plane going home. They might discuss this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't know if it was on the same plane, but I know that they discussed this. And because then shortly thereafter, Deal had a book signing tour in the UK. He went, mm-hmm. and, he went and saw Paul Cornell at his place during that. And very shortly after that, there was a, uh, a dinner meeting, which I know that uh, uh, Stephen Moffat and, and Deal talked about, where... Moppa did reveal that, yes, I'm, I'm going to be thinking over the show, not announced yet. And Neil said, yes, Steve Baffer told me that a few months ago. <laughs> <laughs> and then they started pitching ideas back and forth. And one of them was the idea that turned into The Doctor's Life. And a big it, it, starting point was actually what you called the subplot on the podcast. It wasn't. It was, it was, like, it was the main plot to begin with. Basically, doing the classic story of the, the most dangerous game, you know, a hunter and the hunted, mm-hmm. with, with the TARDIS having been taken over by something and made the dangerous place the doctor has to now navigate and survive it. Yeah. That was, a, that was the origin point of the story. But as the more he thought about it, and he was thinking about this on the plane right over, and then he, myself, and his daughter Holly all met at a table at a restaurant here, here in my town when I was handing him over the latest DVDs, because I think the Series 4 had just debuted that same week. Mm, right. And we talk it over, and he, he had realized on the way here that he can't really have the Doctor be the one under that kind of threat, because he knows the turf too well. He's got too much of a home field advantage. Mm, yeah. So really it ought to be the companion who's in there. 
and the doctor yeah. stuck outside, and he's got to save the companion. He's in in that in that hunt. And he's like, okay, well, if the if it's been taken over, what's happened to the normal TARDIS? It, it's soul, it's it's life force, it's whatever you want to call it, matrix. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think that came up. It, it was yeah. never meant to be the, the Galfrey matrix. It's just like a computer mm -hmm. matrix that runs it. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's happened to that? And that spiraled into well, it's get you can have to take it out of the TARDIS and put it somewhere else. What if that's a person? And then the, the, the light bulbs went off, and ooh, yeah. now we've got something here. And it, it all developed that, that way. So it kind of went back to front in the, the development point. It, as indeed the episode does, and that's the way the TARDIS communicates. She communicates in reverse sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. one, one of the very last right things that went into the final drafts was when when it became clear that one of the big things were that this episode is about is about communication between the two mm -hmm. of them and how this is the first time mm -hmm. that they can finally talk. And I'm sitting there at looking at the draft that Neil's looking at me and I'm going, um, yeah, this should really about be about communication. So then he has them say hello at the end of the episode. Mm -hmm. And that's the last thing she says. I just wanted to say hello. And he sets it up. Then you get the way you run in a bit at the beginning where she says goodbye. To she him. says goodbye at the start. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that <laughs> whole thing, and that was kind of also in response to another one of the Stephen Moffat's best notes was, let's make them cry with crying mm -hmm. capital letters. <laughs> and that, that's the thing that hit people, was when, when mm -hmm. I just wanted to say hello. Hello, doctors. It's so very nice to meet you. And then she very yeah. quietly also says, I love you, as she fades away. Just hear that. Mm -hmm. thing. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. You turn up, turn up the volume as she's fading away. And you'll hear okay. I need to look out for that. <laughs> well, as means of communication goes, it's probably better than um, trying to turn people into homicidal maniacs and um, <laughs> whatever the whatever goes on. <laughs> yes, but that up, that obtuse, mm. strange means of communication that you've got in, in the edge of destruction that was very mm. much a, 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 an under, undercurrent theme that, we, that yes, yeah, I suggested yeah, yeah. should be in this. Mm. Because she exists in all of our time and space, Mm. Very difficult to pin it down to a linear yeah. timeline like we exist in, and that the doctor exists in, except when he's out of the vortex. Yeah, so we were discussing that in the, in the podcast. What, yeah, this sense of you know, can the TARDIS see in you know, the past and the future uh, you know, and the present all at the same time? I, I don't. Know if, and there was a bit of that that sort of came across in the show, but it wasn't entirely clear. Yeah, that was the idea. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, uh, did you spot other things? You said you'd made some notes uh, of the bits we got wrong <laughs> when we made. Or you didn't know. Uh, let's see here. Do you want me to just take them in order? Yeah, just, you know. What, what, uh, yeah, okay. Whatever, whatever was. Uh, uh, okay, when it came to the sequencing of what happened and, and why it happened in the production order. So, yeah, they were cooking this up before, right about the time David Tennant announced he was going. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. No, I remember the, that first discussion that we had that I talked about. Mick David was having his wobble where he was talking about, who oh, maybe I didn't want to stick as Moffat had talked about yeah, this at yeah, this point. Yeah. And I think he'd mentioned Neil's name uh, that mm -hmm. he might be writing for us. And and he had told him the, the cracks storyline that was going to run through Series 5, the cracks in time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that all sounded good to, to Dave, but then he finally said, no, I've got to stick my guns. I've got to, I've got to go and I did. Mm -hmm. But was during that um, the, the cracks business was going to feature very heavily in the story had it been in series five. And, I was wondering how it would fit it in. Yeah, well, I wanted it to be episode eleven of series five because mm -hmm. they wanted they figured this this switch that we're pulling in the show, what the Doctor being able to talk to the Fardis for the first time ever, mm -hmm. might be the kind of thing that you only throw when you're about to destroy the Tardis for good, mm -hmm. which is the the running plot line that's being hinted at all through series five. Yeah, yeah. And he sees you know the bits of the the, the sign from the front, the police telephone mm -hmm. reviews the public side that he finds in the crack when he when Rory disappears in, yeah. at the yeah. end of Cold Blood. All those sorts of things, and also when at the start when they're flying into the the bubble universe, they were originally going to fly through a giant version of the crack. Oh, okay. no, it would have been that was how they got there. Um, hmm. Through one of the, those kind of cracks. I see. 
as and it was going to be a very downbeat ending, a very funereal ending because they were they were mm-hmm. going to there was a lovely scene where they were going to bury if this wasn't going to just fade away. The, there would be a dead body, and they that they mm-hmm. find somewhere to, out in space on an asteroid or on a small planet, and they were going to bury her. And there was this daisy chain on the grave, I think, probably that. And the whole idea is the doctor's afraid that this is really about to happen, mm. that the TARDIS is actually going to be destroyed, right? And it's, yeah. of course, that's what ha- we we see that's happening in Pandora Opens. That's what we get in Pandora Opens. Yeah, I mean, it would have so been, it was going to be a very, very different in in that order. Very much mm-hmm. different story in terms of that had it been in, in series five. Mm-hmm. But as as they were going through production. They had to do a lot of reshoots on the first block, and that had a knock-on effect throughout the year. It, re- it severely reduced the budget that was able to make Hungry Earth and Cold Blood. I saw one of the things, me being this clandestine underground extra sort of script editor, was I got to see drafts of Series 5 episodes as they were coming right. in right. as well, because they, they were sharing them with Neil Neil with Cheryl, with the DC mm-hmm. too. And I remember the, the Hungry Earth Cold Blood was a lot better on those original pages than it ended up being, and it was all because of budget cuts. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, was, it was a much vaster, grander scale to the happenings of that story that we, that we basically saw. And when they got down to, they, they were saving Doctor's Wife. It wasn't called that yet. It was, it was still bigger on the inside. Though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The very original title was The House of Nothing. All oh, right. Okay. So what the, the, a, a, an original no, notion for house was going to be a haunted house, and specifically a haunted light house. It's going to be a sort of lighthouse creature in this bubble universe um, mm-hmm. overlooking everything. And so, yeah, the, this, this email came through saying that we've reached, one of the script editors emailed him and said, um, we've reached a point in where we're going to have to make the last two episodes in the cheaper areas of Cardiff. Mm-hmm. And we can't we can't possibly afford to do your episode this year. We we tried some rewrites to maybe ourselves to maybe try and make this work in the cheaper areas. Of Cardiff. We can't come up with anything. Mm-hmm. And so they well, the final block. If you look at that, the final block of that year was Amy's Choice and the Lodger. And yeah, right, in which so. are both both of them are made in the cheaper areas of Cardiff. And I guess that's how Amy's Choice came to be. Was they needed a really easy to film story where it, it all all he uses location stuff in Cardiff on a weekly day and mm. the TARDIS interior. And that worked. That's a really good episode. I, I really like mm-hmm. how that turned out. Here some of those the smaller scale things are sometimes my favorite ones. But anyway, so they, they said, but we are gonna make this. This is not not like a lot of these other writers that we've cut loose already mm-hmm. this year. It's mm. for one thing, we almost have a royal command in that we already have this contest going. For the, the Blue Peter Design of Tardis console competition. Oh, of course, yes. yes. Yeah. Mm. So we've got to come through on that. Now, they, they kind of hit, deferred there, and the original idea was the kids were going to come and get to see the episode being shot, and then that, that had to be deferred another year. Mm. They had kept the te- the tenant console room around all season long so that they could use it in Doctor's yeah. Wife. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then that couldn't happen because of this budget issue. So they then they think, well, we've got to do something with it this year. Oh, I know. We could we could tap that extra scene out of the beginning of Eleventh Hour, and that whole sequence of him, you know, he almost hits that spire on the on the church or whatever that was. Yeah. Where he's yeah. the front. That was all added in, almost just to justify the fact that they kept the con- the tenant console oh, really? okay. <laughs> all year long. Yeah. And yeah. then they realize, okay, so what we go, what we've got to do that. We do need the space. Make sure that Neil's episode gets made in the first block for series six. Right. In production terms, it was really only a delay of three, about three months. I so by so. then on series six, you've got a new a new budget year, mm-hmm. uh, and then they could afford to do things. Although in, still there were uh, budget restrictions in it, and there was the amount of writing effort that went into this story was in, into that episode was probably three times what it normally is. Mm-hmm. And I know the issue came up of who. Who wrote what? This, that, and the other. Alf. I was seeing all the drafts, or at least all of Neil's drafts. And I didn't always see Moffat's. There was a for the, the series five version. Neil did about three and a bit of drafts that he submitted, right. and that was pretty much all his work. Like you, you would respond to their notes, of course, what they wanted. It was mainly yeah. picking things up, trying bring 
the, the stuff that's happening later in the episode bring it forward. Mm-hmm. That was the main note that they, they kept getting there. But that when it came to the series six version, some things had to change. Like they had to add Rory because I was going to say because Rory would have been missing. I was just about to say well, Rory was missing from had it been in had it been series five, it would have been during the period where Rory didn't exist because he fall into mm-hmm. the trap. And the series five version had little hints that maybe Amy's remembering a little bit, and she and mm-hmm. Neil had to insert the. There was a scene where she fought, she finds the wedding ring, and like, mm-hmm. why is this here? Yeah, and it it beginning to trigger her memory a bit mm-hmm. to set up the the finale. So you had to write Rory in. They they said to him, we could do this thing where we drop him off somewhere or we'd keep him out of the way for the whole set. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Neil said, no, no, no. I, I like Rory as a character. Let me use mm-hmm. him. And let me see if I can get this in there. And he did. And he, so he mm-hmm. wrote a new draft. At least one, maybe two new drafts for the Series 6 version. Then he, he was starting to get a little stuck on some of the notes that were coming back. And at the same time, his career is... He's extremely busy. He's trying to juggle mm-hmm. a few other things. Uh, he's spending longer on this than he had scheduled for it. So he said, I, yeah. Stephen Hoffman, look, I, I think I need some help here. Could you do a draft, please? Mm-hmm. And then he did. And incorporate directly the notes that he was trying to get, get Neil to, to take on board. And then Neil would do another draft in response to that. And then Moffat would do another draft in response to that. And they mm-hmm. tennis balls like this back and forth several times. Yeah. yeah. There were a few drafts in the middle of that where they all did kind of a circular writing where they... I remember there was a sequence where they were going to bring back the communication cube in the middle. Right. And had, if, had that be the way that the Doctor communicates to Amy and Rory while they're stuck inside the TARDIS and it's on its way yes. away. And they're trying to follow them at their, and they're going... Rather than use the telepathic circuits in the, in the TARDIS, which mm-hmm. was the original idea that did it, Moffat and, and I don't know which one, which of them came to this first. I, I just remember being in a shopping mall and getting an email from from Neil and me looking at, the, at my phone, going, "Okay, why is he suddenly asking wh- where the doctor got the communication cube from in the first place in the war game?" Uh, <laughs> um, well, he just took it out of his pockets. The answer. Mm. And then they did a draft where they that's in there and they're using that, and then they realized, "No, wait, this is taking too long. It made the scene ten minutes long." They, they mm. cut it all out again. So yeah, they, yeah. They, there was some circular drafting like that. And mm. in the end result, my estimation for what I saw was the basic story is all heels. Mm. The actual writing of what's in there, and portion-wise, I'd say it's about 60 65% Neil, 30 35% Stephen Moffat, and then trace amounts of lots of other people, like the director, the actors, and mm. a couple of traces of myself, just trace and find you them. But that's about what it was. But then that 35% that I say, that's really the full effort of a full episode, really. Because mm-hmm. it's, like it's, it's like this was written three times over, at least. So, yeah, the amount of effort that they both put into it was far and above a normal mm-hmm. one, I, I believe. The other other budget things kept up. Like, there was a sequence during the Chartist chase seat bit where, and, and as we got it, while we see of the deeper interior of the TARDIS is lots of corridors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of which are vertical, which was a Richard Clark, the director. That was his idea was to do a, uh, I said, just do the classic Russell T Davis up and down chase. Mm-hmm. When it has some of these corridors be vertical with anti-gravity that you get, get up and down you. That was, that was Richard Clark's idea. But Neil and Stigloff always wanted to have at least one other room that we would go into mm-hmm. that we'd always heard about in the classic show in the series five version. That was going to be the swing pool. Mm-hmm. Okay, and yeah. it was going to be a bit where the, the, the well, we were going to find out the house had somehow jettisoned. Uh, yeah, I think house had to do a bit of jettisoning, try and get moving, and it had deleted the swing the swimming pool walls, but not the water, and the water was all okay, okay. still there. And you walk up to it and be this wall of water, and Amy was have to try and she was trying to she was running away from nephew. Nephew's pursuing her. We saw a nephew a lot mm-hmm. more in, in the series five version. That was a question that came up in the podcast with. What would Amy have been doing by herself there? Well, there was a lot more back and forth between House talking to her and also Nephew chasing her directly. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. And she was going to have to swim sideways into this thing and swim through the swimming pool. Okay. Then that all had to go because A, they realized the, the effects budget on um, that was going to mm-hmm. blow everything. And B, they discovered Karen Gillan couldn't swim. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> to that. So then Neil, Neil then, okay, Rory, 
sw- in the series six version. Rory swims in the swimming pool to get away from mm-hmm. Nephew. They go, no, 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 we can't afford it. Please don't do it. And then even <laughs> when we do see some of the deeper interior in Journey to the Center of the TARDIS, where I, that one feels, in Series 7, Journey to the Center of the TARDIS feels to me like they're cleaning up this deeper TARDIS stuff that they couldn't afford to do. Mm. Uh, either because of it wasn't just money, it was also space limitation. Because they're shooting, uh, they're, they're still in Upper Boat Studios, I believe, at the time. And they're still, they're shooting two episodes back to back. Dr. Black was shot in a, the same block as Night Terrors. Night Terrors. Right. Right. It's a Mark Gatiss mm. one. That was the original yeah. sequence in the 36 was going to have Doctor's Wife was going to be episode three, and Night Terrors would have been episode four. Yeah, because that's the one that they switched to the back home. And then they eventually yeah, decided, we got too many dark mm-hmm. stories in a row here. Let's move that one to the back half, the Series 6B. But that one that one was on the shelf for a year before we saw it. It was shot mm-hmm. in the first block, and we didn't see it for it. I th- that might have the record of all this time between shooting a show and, and showing the mm-hmm. show was, was yeah. in yeah. the regular series. With the gap as well. Mm-hmm. Right. And then they brought forward Curse of the Black Spot and, and stuffed that in as episode three and then Dr. Black the four. So that's the sequencing thing finally in. Mm-hmm. The swimming pool thing all had, all had to go. And we, we, when we, when we finally did see it in Jury and Center, we see it in the distance as a CG render. We never actually knew <laughs> anything. They've always been afraid of showing the entire swimming pool. Because, it's probably better than the version of Invasion of Time. <laughs> <laughs> and that was specifically in there kind of as a... As a the Invasion of Time was one I said, okay, look at this, take the concepts as true, but please try to ignore that. No, this, <laughs> don't use it in this use hospital. I think he actually said that on the Doctor Who Confidential episode that goes with, with Dr. Light. Don't, don't look, make it look like a disuse hospital. And <laughs> so, trying to avoid all that stuff, and, and because this, the studio space was cramped, meant that they couldn't even do a zero room. Mm-hmm. That was going to be the extra room that they were going to go oh, to. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, that might have been something I suggested and then Neil took it on board or it, he just said what's what's the cheapest room you can think of Steve uh, me Steve mm-hmm. we have two Stephen M's on this sorry <laughs> and I said well there's the zero room there's a, just a big empty room you can make it look like a white void like we've we seen we you know that white void that we see on the Sarah Jane Adventures when yes, yes, Sarah's yeah. talking to the trickster and they're like mm-hmm. why can't we do that again they do it all the time on the cheap show what is it mm-hmm. we can do it here too and so they write in a zero room sequence. And Rory was going to be the, the hero of that, where he was going to have to learn to levitate to reach the. There was a, a button way above their heads that he had to hit mm-hmm. to open the door again. Mm-hmm. So you have to learn to lev- levitate the way the Fifth Doctor does in Castor Valva. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and hit that button and get them out of there before House did something. I can't remember what it was. That, what, there was some threat that House had going at this point, of course, is to pursue. House is playing with his food. And. The exec, one of the other execs came back and said, I'm sorry, we just don't have the studio space to do this, guys. We, we don't have, we, we, I'm sorry, we can't do this. <laughs> Neil and Stephen both going, we can't do an empty room? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you need a big cyclone or whatever. But yeah, like did in the <laughs> right. <or something. laughs> so that all had to go. But as it mm. turned out, the episode still turned out 10 minutes over. Right. Mm. Gosh, right. And it doesn't really show on Doctor's w- Wife, I, I find, because the it was it, most of the stuff that was cut in from the front end. There was going to be more background of the junkyard world. Like I remember, oh, you yeah, guys yeah. had the question about are other time lords coming here? Are other 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 spaceships that that would have been answered in that deleted material? Yes, there were mm-hmm. lots of other spaceships from other any any craft sufficiently advanced enough to generate a space time warp to get it across the universe. That would run on the kind of energy the house needed to live on. Mm-hmm. And so he was attracting them too. And we would have, that would have been made clear in those opening okay, things okay. that were cut. In fact, there's a running gag we still see the end of where the doctor's trying to explain one of the engine designs to Rory that they're looking at above them in the junk. And he gives up and says, Oh, it's spacey wacy. <laughs> and that the word space, the, the term spacey wacy still comes up uh, uh, later in the Ooh. episode. Well, I think when he's building the firewall at the end to explain why. Make sure that this can't ever happen again. And to, um, mm. although we've also explained why, but we can't make the TARDIS be talk again like this because this, this nearly destroyed your being, being put into a, a human body like this. Poppy, literally, it was a miracle that they got through it as it is. You can't ever, and uh, he just gives up and says, It's spacey wacy. Why, why, <laughs> why, why we can't do this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
It does make you, make you wonder when you see those amazing 3D images that, that you get these days in Doctor Who magazine showing you the studio floor setup for, for some of the classic series and you've got you know five or six sets in a, in a sort of pretty tight area some of which are just you know sort of six feet wide and, and a, a bit of backdrop or something that if they could do that in Riverside <laughs> or Lime Grove or whatever that, that, that they couldn't find space for a void now but I guess things are different. I wonder that too although I just by coincidence I just happened to be re-watching The Mind Rubber myself and right. I remember us when I first saw it on PBS here in the States and early off film prints that had not been restored. Yeah, we could yeah. not see the cycle around the backdrop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It looked like yeah. they were in a real void. But now the cleaned up DVD, yeah, oh yeah, you can see it. It's clear they're, they're in a studio. <laughs> yeah. And that's the kind of thing you could get away with in 1968 yes. mm. on the television at the time. In the high def era, which we were now in, you could mm, yeah, it's, yeah. it's things like that that kind of choke off some possibilities where they used to. They used to. I am hopeful mm -hmm. that in the new rtd2 era and with disney plus coming on board and providing money i'm hoping that they also be providing one of those things that they call the volume mm. that studio that they have that they've been using on the star wars series and i'm sure other other uh, your other studios of all these two where they're they're not using green screen anymore they're actually projecting the backgrounds you know on on screens that are around the after it looks so real and they've got the perspective mm. just right that you can't tell right this is and the actors actually have something to look at now they, they've got yeah. wow mm -hmm. that really is the alien landscape i'm on i can see it you know they don't have to just be in a green room with a rock yeah. and that's it you know um, i'm <laughs> hoping that that that's something they're going to have access to with this new season it's, it's it's the evolution of that back rejection thing from the 1950s it, I movies was just thinking that you know what goes around comes around <laughs> it's a fantastic effect i love it Carry Grant oversteering a car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If that had been available when Doctor White was shot, then we would have a lot of these things that we didn't mm -hmm. we wanted to see could have been in there. Although, as I said, it was still too it was still too long. Mm -hmm. It was still a ten minute cut. Now, when eventually the same thing happened to Ned, the Debbie and Silver, there were ten minutes that we cut out of that. But the cuts mm -hmm. in that hurt a lot more, and some of them were made not just because the episode was over, but for, there were other reasons. Mm -hmm things had to go and they, they took with them vital bits of plot and that's why especially the first half of the story has maybe has some holes in it so should we come on to come on to that i see the very next note was what talking about was nightmare and silver also a lot of rewrites no it wasn't actually that that went through a lot fewer drafts mm -hmm. neil did them all himself because Stephen moffat couldn't do them at the time he was too busy doing 50th anniversary stuff right. yeah that was when he was having his right Having his nightmare year, yeah. Yes. And as, yeah, at the same time, the, the whole Caroline Skinner thing happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but Neil pretty much did all the right end itself. Moffat only ever changed one line of that one. And that was just because of a, a, a production thing that happened on the day. Mm -hmm. But I remember seeing that Moffat say he was really pleased with, with the script that Neil given them. It. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, it was it was torn in. We are getting into it now. I do it. it <laughs> and I never felt in Emory and Silver that everyone was on the same page. That the idea that they originally wanted to do, which was uh, make the Cybermen scary again, mm -hmm. and Neil and Stephen Moffat really wanted to be more like they were in the 60s, especially silent and creepy. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that never fully got taken on board by the production team, and that they wound up still as noisy as they ever have been. And they yeah, the... they've still got the stumpy moments. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was very disappointed when they were still off as many mm -hmm. as they were. If we, yeah, it just never quite gelled. And what also, they got a director uh, who they, they hired for his action shops, mm. but they also had two child actors, and yeah. they never he he didn't seem to know what to do with them, and that was a lot of the material that got cut. Right, right. was with was with our our, our two child. Uh, actors partly i think there was some miscasting there too and and this a director really didn't just didn't uh, function mm -hmm. well with them so a lot of their material which explains some of the stuff that going on in the first half had uh had to go and again, and again it was too long again it wound up being yeah. 10 minutes too long so mm -hmm. that part of the, the failure the, i think the second half actually still works pretty well of that yeah. Silver. and one one good thing about nightmare and silver it, it's really the first one where i feel like they finally and it, this was deal, but they finally got to grips with Clara taking charge of a situation mm -hmm. and being the boss 
and telling everybody what, what, to, uh, what to do and how we're going to defend this castle and all this, which she hadn't really done up to that point. Mm. And from then on, that's her character. And, and I feel like that was it kind of, if, it, if Nightmare on Silver did nothing else, it clarified Clara a great deal. She suffered in the early going with this early version of the character who was going to be Beryl. I was going to ask, this started off being written for, for the Beryl the Victorian. Yes, yes. And, and, the, and were, the kids were going yes. to be from that era too. Right. Like the, those kids that we see in the snowman, it would have been them. Okay. Um, carrying through, and that that would have been Victorian Clara, uh, who they should call Clara, should call Beryl. Beryl, yeah, for Beryl Birch. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that would occur to me, but yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, that changed fairly early on. I think at Caroline Skinner's insistence, because she wanted the characters to be modern. Mm. And but that then threw everything out of balance when it came to writing Clara, the governess, and and the kids. Yeah, yeah. And they they sort of sidelined them. Through most of that season, but the one person who didn't tell to do that was Neil. Right, and right. He, so he stuck having to write them because I think he'd he had started on Nightmare at Silver very early on. Right. And they were originally called The Last Cyberman. Hmm. And they became Nightmare at Silver fairly. That's his title. Unlike Doctor's Wife, which is that was a title Stephen Moffat asked for late in the day. Mm-hmm. It, 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 he'd been, that, Neil settled that bigger on the inside. That was his favorite title, but then okay. okay. Stephen Moffat said, yeah, that's going give, to give away the game too much. Let's call the doctor. <laughs> uh, and yes, I know it, this was on JNT posted boards. It, or exactly, it, 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 yeah. chalk board. I know all that, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> and for for some of the same sensationalist reasons mm. that JNT put it there in the first place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm intrigued about this two, ten minutes too long thing. In the sense of, I mean, I I, I understand that they that they carve out slots in in the broadcast schedule, but I guess you know three three or four months out. If you say to them, actually, it's fifty five rather than forty five, you know, it, is that a so big a crime? I mean, it feels like these days things like Strictly Come Dancing. I mean, it's 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 a different length every week, and it seems to be that not that big a problem. And maybe it was diff- different in the late twenty. Live shows have that latitude. Yeah. Uh, when when you're making a show that you're going to be selling abroad, and you fold everybody, these right. you're going to have a set okay. of forty five minute episodes, twelve of them. Here they are. The special, yeah, that can be longer, and we can stretch it. It's a special. We said it, right, it's, right. In the, it's in the mm-hmm. name, special, but for the regular episodes, they had to stick to a, a pretty tight time. It's probably more of a hangover because of having to service the various markets, and yes, and, at that, and at that time with broadcast, and again, in this the the age of streaming, everything seems to vary as well. A lot of the dramas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had streaming like, what, can allow yeah, it. Okay. Expanding contrast, right. and that's going to, yeah. Right, you're not having to deal with commercial time slots. Like, mm-hmm. like the, the American television was always, it still is, the, the broadcast networks seem to be fading pretty fast now. Mm-hmm. They're still stuck into the, the structure of having exactly, say, 42 minutes and 30 seconds. I was going to say 42 it's come down yeah. to, hasn't it? Exactly yeah. that much content, and then the rest of, the, of an hour is filled with commercial breaks. Mm-hmm. And you can never vary from that. They've got to be exactly the, the same every time, which is the reason why mm-hmm. PBS always showed Doctor Who in these weird time slots, because mm-hmm. it doesn't vary so much. Right, mm-hmm. and they, they had to stick in a late on weekends or on a Sunday afternoon when they weren't having to hit the network clocks. Mm-hmm. A little known thing that uh, I know the British fans always get on us about how the fact that we got to see the five doctors two days before you did. <laughs> but you, uh, I think we're over it. We're over it. <laughs> just, only just, but yes. But what you didn't know and what we didn't realize for a long time was our version was edited. Right. They they, oh. they ran. They decided to run that on a national network mm-hmm. on November the 23rd, 1983. And it had to fit a net hard network clock of 89 minutes and 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. The actual runtime of Five Doctors, I think, is 91-ish, 90 and a mm-hmm. few seconds. So they had to trim it by about a minute and 40 seconds. And there were five little cuts that they made throughout the show that would never wound up in the, even after the that initial run, it never got restored in the broadcast back. It was always the 89 mm-hmm. minute and 30 second version. And I never saw those little bits until the VHS came out years later, where they they yeah. had to make similar cuts because of the tape length thing, but they made them at different points. Right. And right. there were these other things. I'm like, what? What's that? I know this story like the back it's of my head. It's always weird when something like that pops yeah. up. I can one. recite the five yeah. doctors word for word by this point, all the way through. But then suddenly there's this extra little bit of scene where the matches say, these thunderbolts are everywhere. He'd never said that before. We didn't see that <laughs> part. What? What's this yeah, charred yeah. corpse on the ground? We didn't see that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. Right. Gosh. 
So you had that up on. Mm. All right, back to uh, let's go back to my notes. Yeah, yeah. The, someone was talking about the junkyard at one point. That was going to have some extra little things. Like that. the stage direction in the script actually called the Totters Lane at the end of the universe. Oh, right. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. So, and the stage directions also indicate that one of the pieces of junk, and this would put it in my. You don't see it in the episode, but I think you do see it in the confidential that went with this. Mm -hmm. Was an old piano. Okay. That was there. Can you guess why? Well, I don't know. Is, oh. it, a, is it a reference to the o organ in the Attack of the Cybermen? I don't know. No, with the, the no, it's a, it's a TARDIS reference to the sound. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. The, the, yes. the, the, the key that was dragged along a string to make the sound effect of the TARDIS mm, yeah, of deserialization. Yeah. Yeah, that that was why why I asked for that thing. Uh -huh. It was there. I saw a picture of it on the set too, but I don't mm -hmm. think we actually see it in the final edit. Mm. Let's see. Oh, if you guys asked a question. Are we? outside the universe just so that we can have Time Lords in this story? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Because it had been set up by the Ninth Doctor that yeah. when Rose asked, oh, couldn't there be some other Time Lords out there? And he's pointing at his head telepathically. Mm -hmm. He would sense them if there were. And the, yes, and the, and yeah. the few times that they'd come back, he, mm -hmm. he did get a telepathic sense. Like when the Master finally comes back out and watch, he in the yes, that yeah, human on the yeah. Doctor's face, suddenly he can sense him. He's there. Mm -hmm. And the whole bit where they're chasing after each other in the end of time, and, and uh, one of the better parts of end of time, which is a somewhat weak story. And I don't hit it as much as the Radio Free Scar guys do, but I, I do love those chase scenes where they're out on the out on, the, on those landscapes. And the the, the mm -hmm. effects that U.S. Lynn got there uh, were fantastic and it, telepathic sense again. Mm -hmm. And because he's not having it, if if you go outside the universe, well, they'll, now you can have it. And so that's mm -hmm. that's the reason why it had to be. This bubble universe outside of our universe. Mm. So, it's, yeah. it's interesting because that was one of my, you know, one of the few faults I picked in the Doctor's Wife when we were, when we were watching it was was I felt like the escape from the universe, like you know, let's let's just pop outside of the universe and into another one. That felt like it was a bit quick, but given that if they would have gone through a crack, yes, exactly, in, some way in the in the series five version, mm. then you've got a, you've got something that's much more set up and. But it's a, okay, weird stuff could happen. Yeah, it's a leftover um, thing from the series five version. Yeah, and you and you just want to start the story, obviously, as and get there, get to House's House's asteroid as quickly as possible. So, and let's see, you talked about having Michael Sheen on the show. That was Neil Neil's idea to to bring him mm -hmm. in. They, they had made if you've listened to the David Tennant podcast where he's talking to Michael Sheen and Michael Sheen brilliantly tells the story of how they were. Uh, at that restaurant, and they got raided by the feds because it was serving Ill illegal endangered species. <laughs> yeah, that that listen to the the David Tennant does okay. a podcast oh, with Michael that. Sheen, yeah. and towards the end of it, he tells the story of how Michael Sheen and Neil Gaiman first hooked up. In fact, I think I might have. He talks about a package that he that he got sent. I think I was in the room the day that Nico Lorraine is insistent with packing that up to send to Michael Sheen, and so that was how they they first hooked up. And they were friends, and Neil suggested him to, hey, that he, he could be a great house's voice. And there was a bit that got cut where he was going to have, we we're going to see more of house's sense of humor during the, the chase scene. He was going to be doing an almost boss-like singing at them. What the song was, if you were the only boy in the world and I was the only girl. And Michael Shee would have been singing that. But uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, as nephew chasing Amy and Roy around the forest, but they, oh, okay. and they decided not to go with that. But it was written in there. The bunk beds joke, yeah, that one's Neil's. Uh, he, he had that in there. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, another <laughs> of the big jokes people I've talked about is Amy's line: uh, "Did you wish really hard?" When he tells her that he is a woman. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that was Stephen Moffat. Yeah, you put that in. Now the sexy mm -hmm. stuff that you guys were talking about that. If, yes. Why mm -hmm. you can call her sexy? And yeah, Neil put that in while well, I was riffing on how the doctor called her that in the 11th hour, which Stephen Moffat wrote. So he's, he's picking right. up a Stephen Moffat thing there. So it's very, this was very much a collaborative writing. There was mm -hmm. never a, a, yeah. a case of, you go away, I'm going to rewrite you. Like yeah, maybe yeah. certain script editors have done in the past. No, it was always communication going back and forth all the way through. In fact, even on the day something happened, I remember I had a, a copy of the shooting schedule and I was just daydreaming, looking, sitting on, my, on this couch that you see behind me here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Looking at the schedule, like, oh, I think I'll just read the scenes that are going to be shot today. This will be fun. This is happening now as I'm reading. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is cool. And I, <laughs> I'm looking at the line. I'm going, 
and it's the doctor meeting Idris in the prison for the first time. Mm-hmm. And when one of her lines, she uses the word hello. And I go, oh, crap. This mm-hmm. happened in one of these rewrites, one of these many rewrites. That got, and I don't know who put, it back, mm-hmm. who put it in there, but she cannot say hello at this point. And it, it, it reminded me of it, this happened on Star Trek The Next Generation where they meet Hugh, the board, and he's always saying we. Right. And except right. they, they, accident, they, missed it, they missed one. He does say I at one point. And but she can't say hello at this point. Uh, so I quickly emailed Neil because he, he was, it was one of the two days he was there for that shoot. Right. right. Uh, he wanted to be there for the whole thing, but it, they swapped the production order with Night Terror. They shot, wound up shooting Night Terrors first and then Dr. Wet. And because of that, in his own schedule, he could only be there for the first two days. But he was still there, I, I think. And I said, look, she can't say that yet. And he go, oh, but it's too late. We can't change it. Can we? It's just one word. Can, can we let mm-hmm. Saran Jones, please. And then they fixed it. And so uh, they could have done it maybe in ADR, but it would have looked a little awkward to see someone yeah. say yeah. one word. But they did fix that last last second. Let's see what else have we got. And you asked about why does the Ood have green eyes when normally they're there? Oh yes, yeah. Paul was asking that. Well, when we have a normal Ood, they have normal, almost human colored eyes. Then when they get possessed by Satan or what, or whatever it is, they turn red and come after. Mm-hmm. They went with green eyes here because green was kind of the the color for house. House was yes. Yes. The, house green, green gas. Gas. the green yeah. gas. The green gas. Right. The green. There was an early notion of actually attaching a hose to the top of the TARDIS and going over the light, and it was a mm. pump the yellow light of the TARDIS out and then pump the green gas of oh, okay. of, of, of house into it. Or it wasn't a, a hose; it was a tentacle, because the original in the series, the early drafts of series five version, there were tentacles everywhere. And mm-hmm. I, I think I pointed out, and then they pointed out too, that you know if science fiction doesn't like doing tentacles if they don't have to because it usually looks pretty bad <laughs> and, and expensive. And so that that all got that all got cut. Yeah, it was was a more organic feel to house in, in the mm-hmm. beginning. And in fact, there's a there's a deleted scene that Neil did post from the deleted from the drafts that they never got even close to shooting this of of having dinner with Auntie and Uncle in House's domain early on in the show and, and all the food being squirted out of tentacles and, and, you know this puddle and that that if you dig around in the archives of Neil's blog on his website neilgamer.com I think he he posted it there once and he probably still find it there right the dinner scene he was very he really liked that scene I, I kept mm-hmm. thinking this is dragging it to it, making things too slow they said the same thing so they eventually mm-hmm. ended up I think I, I prefer the the idea of house being like a non cor yes more non corporeal yeah than if you if you if you add tentacles and things then that suggests well hang on is it some although that would know, all grow that was something uh, another line that I think was recorded with Todd was the notion that house had got there as a spore and, and right, well, right, he yeah. fell through the crack. And grew mm-hmm. there. That's that uh, as he kept feeding off of time energy, from, mm-hmm. both from the crack itself, because time energy would be le- leaking through it. Yeah, and then from the the TARDISes of other spaceships. It's also well connected to Series Five in that regard, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a setup. Yeah, the whole I stole a Time Lord and, and ran away. And I, how you thought that when in the name of the name of the Doctor, one of the of the Doctor stories, it looks like Moffat trod on over that by having cars mm. say steal this part as well. You gotta remember, originally the Great Intelligence messed that up. This is true, yes, yeah. It happened the way we saw She's only putting things back, yeah. yeah. Right. She's putting things mm-hmm. she's restoring things. Right. It's mm-hmm. so it's it doesn't really trot on it at, at all. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, yeah, it's the villain messes up what it was established and what was established mm-hmm. had been established, which we said. And then mm-hmm. Clara puts it back against so that's okay. In my opinion, anyway. Oh, and there was one point where Neil suggested, hey, what if we suggest that maybe House is going to become the great Elish? Ooh, Ooh, and right. Stephen Moffat did not use that. We wanted to okay. and he didn't, didn't say why at the time. At least I didn't see hmm. I didn't say why. I didn't see all the email traffic, but I, I saw a lot of it. And we went, well, why he didn't do that? Well, we had other things to worry about. And then <laughs> along comes... The Great Intelligence does make a comeback. Yes, yes. And, and mm-hmm. who knows if that even happened because Web of Fear had been discovered. Mm-hmm. That in mm-hmm. I'm not. Sh- I'm still not sure about all sequence of events on that. Oh, there was a line that they, they asked Neil to include to help set up 
what was going on in series six, and that was oh, the only water in the forest is the river. Hmm. To set up the river song business, that's one of the things Idris said just before she dies, but she can see that in the future. And then they know that, aha, this and that comes up in a good night goes to war. Yes, this had to be a one off. This was never going to happen again, at least if we mm-hmm. now what out, he will talk to Darz this directly. Mm-hmm. Closest we've ever got to that is the, the hologram here and there, and where it's saying computerized phrases. TARDIS console flight, that's a direct lift from Inferno, flying a console around oh, my world. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And, oh, Susanna Lee's credits. Susanna Lee was the was the girl who won the Blue Peter contest for Design the Junkyard. Oh, uh, right, yeah. And I mean, when we got to see the five, what was almost the final edit, like about a month before it aired. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm reading the credits to see, did I sneak in there? No, of course not. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not unofficial. I, 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 I didn't sign the confidentiality. <laughs> Yeah, but that was another funny thing that all this we're we're being all this careful about. I didn't really. I'm not. I'm not supposed to be here. Uh, the production staff can't know I'm on. I'm helping. I think was. I think Stephen Moffat knew with this one. Mm-hmm. And then, as it turned out, they had forgotten to send me all a confidentiality agreement to sign until like a month before it aired. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we were fine all the time. But anyway. I, I'm looking at those credits, and I read, wait a minute, they, they never credited the Junkyard console designer. It, mm-hmm. She was missing on the credits. And I think the episode, the version that aired, she's not there, but she is on the DVD version, and I forget Ooh, what's on the okay. iPlayer. I don't know what's on the iPlayer. I don't have... Um, mm-hmm. I, don't have mm-hmm. I can't check that out, but she, so on some of the credits, she's there, and some of them she is mm-hmm. because they forgot to right. put her in there. Yeah. yeah. They might have incurred the loss of Billy Baxter. Yeah, <laughs> she was still around. <laughs> I made sure I collected all the ancillary stuff that I knew was coming, um, mm. and sa- saved it on the DVD file. Thing. And, and one of the things is when that Blue Peter contest started, it was started by Elizabeth Slate on the set, and it might have been the last oh, time right. she did I something. Don't think that, mm. that, that might, I think that might have been the last time she did something officially on the air, apart from shoot those three Sergio Adventure shows that they did. Mm-hmm. They did finish before they got ill. So that's a little uh, melancholy there. Oh, you were asking about the Corsair, and could we see Adventures of the Corsair, the character of, uh, with the, the Ouroboros snake tattoo on his arm that was yes. Yes. wound up on Uncle's body, I believe. And, yeah, the, well, there is the story that Neil wrote for him in The Adventures of the Lockdown. Mm. And Russell T. Davis liked the character so much that he was going to do a bit of a retcon had Sarah Jane Season 5 been finished. They were going to bring this back that fortune teller-like time character who we'd seen in Series 4. Mm-hmm. And when we saw him in Season 5, uh, with Neil's assent, which he gave, uh, or was going to give, they were mm-hmm. going to say that this was the Corsair. And that he had, right. he had either, either he had somehow survived or we're seeing him at a point before you end up at House's domain. We never never got any, any will of that. So yeah, they could have done something. But yeah, he's got this pretty good swashbuckling story about mm-hmm. the Corsair in the Adventures of Lockdown story. If you want to see some Corsair adventures, there they are. Mm. Another little idea I had, I don't think it got very far because we were, getting, we were getting too close to production, was that, you know, if you've got the there's the part where the doctor opens the closet and there's all those Time Lord message boxes and you're hearing Time Lord going, please help me. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yes. I yeah. suggested, hey, let's get Colin Baker to record one of these with Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> but that, they, they, that didn't happen. <laughs> Oh, and one one thing, uh, a great idea of Stephen Moffat's that had to be cut at cough freezes was uh, the scene where we look over the, that vista of junk and the one line that I suggested that wound up in the pretty much as I said, it, just in the show with Idris says, I think all my sisters are dead. They were devoured mm-hmm. looking at their corpses. That was something I, I, I'd asked for and it wound up in their hand. But mm-hmm. while they're looking at the junk, Moffat wrote in a, a bit where we were going to reveal that the chameleon circuits for these TARDISes were still functioning. And that a lot of the junk that you see there is is actual a TARDIS component, high-tech stuff. Okay. And they sure. were going to have Idris look at, have the Doctor look through Idris's eyes for a moment. Mm-hmm. Because she can see through that. And yeah. it, all, yeah. it would have all just faded and turned into actual technological, real high-tech componentry that they could mm-hmm. then harvest to build, build the console data to, to go on pursuit. That all had to be cut on cost grounds because that was yeah. one yeah. CG shot too many. 
And again, it was adding another minute to a story that was already too too long. But I really mm-hmm. missed that. That was a great idea. A mm-hmm. modest. I wish they, they could have done. Yeah, that even mm-hmm. uh, even a TARDIS component can have a chameleon effect on it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I think the last notes I've got here are why would this have happened? Why did this happen with other TARDISes? Because because they would have done this same procedure. They would suck out the matrix, mm-hmm. put it into a body, and a body of the body dies. Mm-hmm. Harmlessly, the, the energy dissipates. It's not dangerous. Why is this TARDIS being so proactive, being a, a real character as, as mm-hmm. best she can? Why is she helping out? And because it, it, this had not happened before, with, and this was a, this was a, that was a plot point I I thought was a bit of a plot hole, and suggested that there be something to cover that. And it wasn't there. I don't know if they shot it. I don't know if it was in the final shooting script, but it would cut on timing grounds where. Yeah. We would have seen Auntie and Uncle discussing why is this happening? This had never happened before, mm-hmm. and we were going to have the suggestion somewhere along the line that it's because this TARDIS has done so much more traveling than the, the other did. Mm-hmm. She is right. she is so much further developed as a character in her, in her own right mm-hmm. because of her relationship with the Doctor. And I think of the mileage she has put on compared to any other TARDIS we've ever seen in the series, mm-hmm. and how much and how much more traveling she's done. She's done as much mm-hmm. as the Doctor has. And that's the reason why she survived as well as she did when the others all just died. And yeah, that, that got, that got kind of on time grounds. Okay. And the last line, oh, someone asked, him, was this line that the doctor has when House goes up and says, fear me, I've killed hundreds of time lords. And the doctor goes, mm-hmm. and it says, so, and this state direction is sort of voce. Fear me, I killed all of them. That was Neil. Mm-hmm. That was not. That was not. Okay, okay. That was. That was Neil right from the start. That, that was. Right. That was me going. Ooh. Hmm. I, I don't know. That was in the very, very first draft. I, I like. Oh yeah. And that was just. Let's show the Doctor's dark side. He got mm. one. I can almost see yeah. um, a black and white Patrick Troughton with the lines that his face getting really cursed, mm-hmm. saying something like this. Yeah. <laughs> and that was something. That was something else. really cool that uh, Moffat had sent Neil and the other writers Matt Smith's audition tape. And he showed it to me once, and this mm-hmm. so that they all had something to go on. This is how he's going to be playing the part. He could no one see mm-hmm. it yet when it would have ranked to series five, and this is before eleventh hour it aired when I got to see it, and I'm like, oh, wow, he's doing you know Patrick Trout. Mm-hmm. That was the vibe I got from it. And mm-hmm. in the intense scene, the confrontational scene where he's facing down a villain, I'm getting mm-hmm. such a serious Patrick Trout vibe from it. He already had them. Before he had him in his audition, before he'd ever seen any classic films. Right. And yeah. then Moffat then told him, "Go, go watch some Trotten that he did. He raised up, and mm. Matt Smith has written, had many times raved about how good he thought Tomb of the Sovereign was. It's because I'm sure Stephen Moffat saw that too. Is that right. his, his natural instincts were taking him in a Trotten esque direction, mm. and that's probably one of the big reason he won the part. I'm sure. Mm. And so I think that that line there, the fear me, I killed all of them, bit is. A little mm. of that, you know, how the second doctor secretly pushes the buttons to let Klee open the, the hatch yes. into the Cybermen. You know, the dark moments yeah. that he has, or you get evil the Daleks too, yeah, where you're yeah. being, Am I the bad guy? Am I the bad guy? Maybe mm. I am. Yeah, that, that kind of thing. It's one of those. <laughs> That's why that. It's one of those tricky things because trying to, one catch was doing, doing things the way we do and coming back and just like dropping in randomly, you know, and comparing. Random new new series stuff is once you slightly tend to lose track of the yeah exactly where we were in our knowledge of of things and it's funny that um, we watching Nightmare and Silver before this I was thinking oh this is interesting because the whole thing with Porridge uh, the Emperor yeah is yeah. such a foreshadowing of what we get in two episodes time with the War Doctor and the the whole thing I mean I guess maybe it was a bit more. I don't know whether it was a bit more shaped in what we had, what our expectations of what the Doctor had been up to in time or by this point was. But the the moment when Boyd Davis says, oh, you know, you know who I feel sorry for, the person who had to yeah. you know, yes. press the button. And, you know, with, <laughs> he's talking about himself, as it turns out, but he's also, <laughs> yeah, you also think he's also talking about John Hurt. Yeah, <laughs> but that wasn't, yeah, you, I can see why you would think that maybe that's Stephen Moffat doing a setup mm-hmm. thing, but it was it wasn't. That was that was Neil. Um mm-hmm. he, he had that he had that at the Nightmare Silver right from the beginning. But that's and I guess it was 
if Neil had it in his head at that point, you know, clearly because if he had it in his head at, at, by the duck's wife, yes, we know the doctor probably did, you know, did press the button, mm. and so it's it makes sense to be drawing the parallel, even if you don't know what's coming down the pipe in in the 60th, 50th anniversary. You've dropped a memory now that I forgot about this, where Neil put in this this scene where he oh th- this was another thing that they never got on. Um, or again, people weren't on the same page about how Matt Smith mm-hmm. should play the Cyber Flanner. And should he be uh, cold and unemotional, or should he be crazy Joker-like character? And that went with mm-hmm. crazy Joker-like character. Me, personally, I was hoping for the cold and emotional yeah. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. thing, but that isn't what they did. And Matt was under such pressure at this time. I, I, I he, had to, he had to carry so much of that one. And they were under the gun on... The shooting schedule at this point because they'd had a the location shoot got hit by a blizzard and mm. they had a de- they had to delay everything and Matt had to be shooting on that while at the same time they're trying to read the back at then and they can't use the doctor for this right enough as he got to do the nightmare shield silver reshoot that's why he goes absent from read the back at then for a while uh-huh. yeah and they did just just didn't want to press that on him but yeah, there was this, there's a this scene where he's he's confronting the, the doctors confronting the cyber planner in his own head, and we get this flashback to all the previous generations. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. And I remember sticking my hand up to at least to Neil to say, you know, this would be a chance we could actually show the eighth doctor, the ninth doctor regeneration that we never saw mm-hmm. in, in, in in the show. <laughs> we could complete the box. Let's mm-hmm. can we do that. I don't know if he passed it on to Stephen Moffat, but and obviously he didn't do it there. And then mm-hmm. and two episodes later, we found out why. Yeah. <laughs> he was doing it. Yeah. He would know. There's another doctor in there that we we don't see in this book. Ah, yeah. God knows how that would work in terms of the um, considering what a late invention yeah. Yeah. the War Doctor was. Anyway, I'm not sure where that would connect to. Yeah, when yeah. this was when this was being when Nightmare and Silver was being written, as opposed to yeah when he was when he was writing that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He didn't know any of that, but not, none of that mm. was communicated back yeah, to, yeah. to Neil. He, no, he no. didn't want to know. He, he never wanted to know of stuff that he didn't need to know. No, 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 like he, like when yeah. he was writing the Series 6 stuff, I th- mm. they sent him the overall pressy of what each story was going to be, but nothing beyond mm. that. He, he, didn't, yeah. he didn't have to know. Like, we, yeah. didn't, we had no idea mm. we didn't have the, the real Amy in Doctor's mm-hmm. Blood, that that was, that was flesh Amy the whole time. Yeah. That was, right. yeah. neither Neil nor I knew that. Really, you, you, mm. Neil knew you didn't tell me. Uh, so that was a bit of a shock when we get to the end of <laughs> the Almost People. But wait yeah. a minute, we weren't writing for a real Amy. But then how was they? How were they controlling her through the into the u- other universe? Well, I guess they did. That's how powerful they are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So he didn't want to know yeah, those things. Says so either want to watch, be able to watch those and enjoy them. You know, without. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes it's better not to remember all those things because it's easier just to, to in, in, enjoy the, the story for what it is. But yes, I, I agree that be, because we're Doctor Who fans, we kind of like to go into all of those things, as uh, continuity things as well. I, I mean, I, I, I watched Night, Nightmare in Silver earlier today. I, I, I did actually greatly enjoy it, but I did think that the Matt Smith two parts in the same head thing is the one thing that, that didn't just quite worked me i think because it was a bit too manic but i mean your explanation of of why it is the way it is makes an awful lot of sense i also the association i made around porridge and the emperor was was like from the uh, foundation series when you discover that the who the um the mule is i mean i, I won't i won't throw any spoilers out if in case anyone hasn't read the, that that series of i read it 30 ago years off. ago i can't remember now yeah yeah but i mean it's a similar sort of thing where it's a character you wouldn't expect who turns out to be kind of like the the, the, the one who's in charge and i i, I don't know whether whether neil is an asimov fan or not well he's a fan of all the classic yeah yeah they name me a, a classic science fiction or fantasy story if it ever won a hugo award he was probably a fan of it yeah. right. <laughs> and yeah. so yes asimov brett he was he was bristol mm-hmm. brett Reed bradbury uh, harlan ellison all of them um i remember harlan did it you know there was a convention Held in Madison, Wisconsin, which wound up being Harlan Ellison. The last one Harlan Ellison did in person, but he was great. He, he kept saying all weekend, I'm going to be dying soon. And actually, he turned out he was a little healthier than he thought he was. He didn't die for another five years, but okay. it was still his last convention. And right. Neil was going to be a surprise guest at that, turned out uh, as well. And because the shooting schedule changed on Doctor's Life, he couldn't do it because they were shooting and he was there busy while this convention was going on. And I remember. 
Neil and I talking about this the next time I saw Neil, and we're, we're talking about is it, what, how Harlan had been off of, uh, during the convention. And then the phone rings, and Lorraine comes, uh, his assistant comes in and says, Neil, it's Harlan. He phoned, phoned up while we were talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Has he bugged the room? What? Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, he knows all those people. He knows all those the, all their, mm. their tricks, and, and he, he employs them himself. Uh, mm. Yes. Yeah, no, I I thoroughly enjoyed. I felt I got a lot more out of rewatching Nightmare on Silver, which again, it's it's the it's our classic thing on this thing that I don't think I've watched it since Transmission. Probably. Yeah, not really. Um, and and I I thought, hang on, why does this have why does this have a bad rep in? And is it is it just the is it just that the expectations were so high after the Doctor's Wife, which obviously no, probably every, pretty either. much everybody loves, and I don't take. I, I take what you say about the the kind of tonal mismatch. It's not like a, a, yeah things don't quite gel together yeah in the same way you know in the same way as they do on the Doctor's Wife where everyone's exactly on the same page. But we did lose more essential scene this time than we did in Doctor. Mm-hmm. But I still I still felt I thought this is thoroughly entertaining. Yeah. Um, there was a part that the they. There were four four whole scenes at the very beginning that were mm-hmm. uh, in, in the you know in the final script, but they cut them and didn't actually shoot them. Where the, the doctor was going to meet up with Clara and the kids in a graveyard, uh, probably mm-hmm. the, the same one half Clara is buried in. We saw right, it briefly yeah. in the Belt of St. John, mm-hmm. and they were going to meet up there, and that's where the whole discussion about I have got a golden ticket to take you to this this uh, right. to mm-hmm. this, this fun fair uh, in the future. Which are, and the original drafts of that, the, the idea was it was going to be um, like Disneyland from the 50s. It was going to be a, a, re- a purposely built retro park in the future, uh, but right. built with 50s, okay. 50s sort of technology. Because uh, oh. mm-hmm. there was going to be a whole business about how if the technology was that old, the Cybermen couldn't harvest it and come back. Mm-hmm. And... Bringing, Angie bringing her phone there was going to be the thing to set everything off because they were going to be able to harvest all the, the technology out of the phone to right, right, complete yeah. the last little bits that they needed mm. to get to get the production line up and running again. Yes. Up until then, they, they all that kind of technology had been pulled away and not not allowed on the planet. That, so that was mm. going to be the insight against it. Yeah. Mm. And but then it turned out they couldn't come up with a, a suitable location I thought that I, I think I, I told suggested to Neil and that the uh, Sarah Jane Adventures had shown had done a whole story in uh, a disused amusement park. Hmm. The one that Brian Miller's in, it well, uh, I can't remember yeah. the title. I think it's a it's, it's a season opener of either series three or four. I thought, oh, they could go back there again, but it turned out that hmm. then, that had been torn apart or closed down or something by this point, so it wasn't hmm. wasn't available anymore. So they couldn't do that, and so they had to go with a, a different kind of. Uh, mm. Funny, my my memories of Doctor's Wife are very clear, and and but the Nightmare and Silver ones have faded more, mm. and even though that's more recent, although not all that much more recent. Yeah. I mean, I felt the the Royal Dal. I mean, the Golden Ticket's the most obvious thing, but the whole, yeah, you know, the whole Royal Dali, you know, shot in the chocolate factory thing. And I I feel like, okay, the the kids are not the strongest actors. In it, but I again, I, and I thought, is this why people don't? But you know, they're barely in. The, you know, yeah, they're, they're pretty. In the, in the final pretty one, yeah. rapidly reduced to just having to stand around. They're yeah. barely in the final version. They were in it a lot more. Originally. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of their material was cut because and, they were not. But, but you know, yeah. they were. And again, again, I don't. The director yeah. was failing to coax the best performances from them. Sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. But slightly bullshy, slightly stroppy, obnoxious kids. Again, it's it fits in with that with the raw dull kind of vibe and setting the side men in amongst that and you know it's it's nice and the, the whole thing with the mechanical turk at the start yeah. with the you know, <laughs> apparently <laughs> big finish had done a, a silver turk story of their yeah. own again with cybermen and i was unaware of that at the time i uh, i stopped okay. i stopped following big I, I, when big finish got going mm-hmm. i followed them religiously up until about mm-hmm. the second year of nick Brick being in charge for that i right. Thought, right. The, i found by that point, the, the television show was back, and I found right. myself not being nearly as engaged with the Big Fish stuff anymore. It didn't seem mm-hmm. nearly as exciting as the TV series, so I stopped listening. 
mm-hmm. except for the odd thing here and there. And I, I was unaware of the, 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 that they had done a Silver Turk story. Had I known, I probably would have told Neil, uh, they'd mm-hmm. done this with Big Finish. Maybe we shouldn't do it. No one in Cardiff said they'd done this with mm-hmm. Big Finish. Maybe we shouldn't do it. So it, it was, mm-hmm. that was a complete coincidence. Okay. I think it's nice. Yeah, I, th- I think I think that's nice, and the the, the whole of VLS with the original, you know, as with the original mechanical Turk, there's some guy behind the scenes pulling the levers <laughs> is is not yeah, is nice, and that's disposed of pretty quickly. I mean, I think I think the thing with the chess game, it feels slightly over, but on the other hand, it's not um, you know, in some ways, it's just a device because it's not a real, it's not a real chess game. The doctor mm-hmm. does say that the Time Lords invented chess in some. Yes, yeah. yeah. But is he just bluff? You know, is he just bluffing? Because at that point, he's what, what he's, is, he's is, lying. That he's lying. That he's got mates in three moves about. But yeah. I think that was Neil's idea, and I said, "Hey, mm-hmm. this this actually ties in pretty well because there's a story in the classic show where Chess yeah. is yes. a big th- deal. Why is it a big Time Lord deal? This time, yeah. explain that that's for his offender. And the whole reason there's a tattoo that made of a big mm-hmm. deal of a doctor's wife, the, the, the one that the yeah. Corsair yeah. had, was. Mm-hmm. Uh, with because of John Furtwee's statue, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, we, we, we thought, it, you know, yeah, yeah, you had to change one of the lines to say that the Corsair deliberately incorporated the tattoo into each regeneration. Mm. And I thought, yeah, that's brilliant. This explains how John Furtwee freshly regenerated as a tattoo in Spear Up in Space. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. came with the regeneration. Oh, so dear. yeah, so maybe I know yeah. if they really want to do this, what they ought to do is use that as kind of an explanation of how the Doctor's clothes have changed. Mm-hmm. In this this latest regeneration that we just seen, you know. Ooh, uh, uh, and, and yeah. it, it's and it's a nice link actually between Fenric and this is that in both cases the way in which the chess game is won is completely outside the rules of chess. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. Can't remember. Um, can't remember if Fenric is one. I had Neil. I had Neil watch or not. Uh, Might have done. He did say one of the better Sylvester McCoy stories. He had not. I don't think he watched them on the, on the first go. I think when we when we did back when way back when when we did Curse of Fenric, I seem to remember refer, probably referring to it as Gaiman esque. Um, no, yeah, <laughs> it is. But I think I think at the time the probably the point of reference that people had for a lot of that season twenty five twenty six stuff was um, Clyde Barker probably mm. would have been more yeah Wee World and sort of all that yeah that sort of he was only yeah. just, he was only just getting in, doing his Sam and stuff yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 The idea of the never yet. That was money. Mm. Yeah. No. No. That's nineties. Yeah. The TV series is surprisingly late, ninety six apparently. But again, it hit very much hit squarely on that. Yeah. Hang on. If they bring back Doctor Who, this is what it's. Yeah. 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 This feels like Doctor Who if it came back. <laughs> it's, it, it's interesting. I think also the within Nightmare and Silver, and you, you can tell me whether whether this is um, you know, something you discussed, Steve. But but the 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 Cybermen and the and the humans are sort of in different positions so because i mean the cybermen must have technology that's as good as human technology so they could just blow up planets as well but i guess the reason why they won't do that is because they want the people for the spare parts Mm. so actually although they're very technologically advanced because they're desperate to catch people it actually puts them in a weaker position i guess if you look at Mm. it like that yeah but yeah they are well i want to say assimilating people yeah. yeah, but then the Star Trek people will go, "Hey, that's the Borg," and I'll go, "Yeah, but <laughs> the Borg who were intro- introduced in an episode called Q Who." Mm. Yeah, <laughs> are you sure that you that 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 idea is as original as you thought it was? Uh, shit. Yeah, they, they're out to converge more than they are to conquer. They'll, mm. they'll, they'll, they'll conquer when they need to. Um, well, the they the conversion for the thing they they want first. But yeah. I mean, I I I, I love those those old sixty Cybermen stories. I mean, um, and and it does feel like they've never quite recaptured the uh, the essence of that in the new series. I thought they took a big step toward that in World Enough in Time. And, yeah, uh, yeah. That I mean, was the that was the kind of Cyberman story that like the one of the better big finish on is that I did listen to it and really loved yes. was Spare Parts. Yeah. yeah, you can really see the links there. Uh, yeah. yeah. That, between that story and what, what's um, of the new era, that's probably my favorite Simon story. Well, enough time, and 
and I, I I agree, and I think World Enough in Time is is you know one of the one of the great episodes in the new series. I was a bit disappointed with the following episode, the Doctor Falls. It sort of felt like that that then they've they've got more kind of groups of Cybermen doing new series Cybermen stuff. But but certainly the the the, the first episode of the two, I think, really, as you say, it captures that kind of horror of what the Cybermen mm. are. Yeah, yeah. There, there comes a point a little, in a lot of seasons where they realize, okay, what else have we got in the cupboard that we can use cheaply? Yes, mm. they, they bring bring those costumes out. Yeah, that we can. <laughs> well, that that was one of the start. Another starting point of Edgar and Silver was the um that the costume store that they had was pretty beat up at this point. They, right. Uh, they didn't have much left, so the, the redesign, the the almost Iron Man look of the of the Cybermen, mm. Edgar and Silver was was part of the the reason I'm not sure for doing the episode of the first place. They needed new cyber suits. Mm. Okay. It's a very nice new design. Definitely. Yeah, nice yeah I, like, I like the design. It looks it's great. Sweet. But as you say, it's the, the stumpiness. The... Right. And we got confused on the whole bullet time thing, too. Where the, there's the one who goes in super fast, that's the oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then they never do it again, and you wonder why. Mm-hmm. And I can't, for the life of me now, I know there was a reason mm-hmm. why it, it wound up this way, and it, something that got caught, and I, but I can't now remember what it was. Mm-hmm. I'm so, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's failing me there. It was long. It was. It was. It took a long time because again, it was. It happened during fear when Neil was busy rang on anything. But it, it seemed like there was a lot less work had to go into getting Nightmare and Silver done. I think he only did three or four drafts of that as opposed right, right. to the. Well, I think we lost count somewhere in the team of Doctor Who. It was. It was mm-hmm. Well, if it was at least a dozen drafts between Ed and, and Stephen Moffat mm-hmm. on Doctor's Wife. But yeah, Nightmare and Silver went left quicker. Oh, he did lose a bit of one. I remember meeting him in a parking lot as he's as he's flew back from somewhere, and I had given something. They had to give me something back, and then they left again. And when he got home, he emailed to say, "Oh no, no! I just realized I've I left my laptop on the computer on the plane going in on." And he had the his initial first few scenes of the doc the Doctor Farrell and the Victorian kids mm-hmm. were on that, mm-hmm. and. The, the laptop never turned up again, and those are so that that's a deleted scene oh, damn. A lot, <laughs> somewhere in 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 probably Delta Airlines. Lost <laughs> 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 and found. There's a deleted scene from Nightmare and Silver that it, that never made it because it because he had to redo it. Well. So do you know, Steve, what, why we haven't seen a, a subsequent stories from Neil? I mean, did he just feel like he'd he'd done it by, by with the two stories and that was fine and he'd moving on to other things? Or? Well, he, 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 his own career just picked up more and more yeah, yeah, yeah. with more and more television uh, stuff and, and his, own, mm-hmm. his own life just got busier and he didn't have the time to do it again. And, sure. sure. Uh, I, and he moved away from me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Nightmare and Silver was finishing up just at the point where he moved away right. to, be, to be with uh, the Van de Palmer, the second wife. He was here originally at first place, first wife from this area. And then they raised their kids uh-huh. together. Uh, I, although I hear it now, um, you know, that, I mean, our, our, our divorcing ago. But like, you've been in New Zealand a lot lately. They got stuck there during, during lockdown. She was doing a concert tour, first of Australia, then New Zealand, then lockdown happened. And New Zealand shut their borders harder than anyone else did all those hmm. And the same reason Mark Strickson wasn't available to do stuff for the oh, collection, right. for the collection set because that's where he lives. Mm. He wanted stuff, and then he also was trying to show run shows during COVID, and it's just been too busy. He was. Mm. He, he, I remember he was originally very keen to try and do something for Peter Capaldi and his doctor, just because they he done he played the Angel isn't important. Yes, yeah, got a history, yeah. But his his schedule just would just. Wouldn't allow it. Mm-hmm. He, he he has been happy to do the odd little thing here and there, like the odd short story for a collection. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. he can he can find the time for that. It's just finding the time when all this other when Sandman is taken off for Netflix. Well, well, that's the thing. It feels like a lot of the logjam of lots of Neil Gaiman related TV series have have all suddenly they flooded in and lost. And obviously, that I guess creates a virtuous circle of. Of people looking for stuff and saying, "Can we do this?" And yeah, we'll see if things ever calm down and then he's able to do something for Russell at some point. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't get my ults up just because of the, the, all the scheduling issues. Although you think they might get a little simpler now that COVID doesn't seem to be as big a problem for people making things anymore. Knock on wood. So yeah, I I don't know if it'll. It, he, he, I think he's open to it. Whether he'll ever get time to do it again. 
Sure. I think that it's been really fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hearing, hearing all of this and really getting it. Yeah, a... thanks ever so much. You, you, you've, you've given us a huge amount of stuff. Inside its view. It's really, really good of you to, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for reaching out and, uh, yeah. Well, it's been great talking to you. I love, uh, I love the podcast. I've been listening for about nine months or so, I think. Okay, well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's these the 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 late these links between the old and the new were kind of what I was doing there. And yeah, yeah. Gosh, it's ten years mm-hmm. now. Yeah, that's kind of what I was doing. Uh, so mm-hmm. yeah, I I like like when it happens. Yeah. Although yeah, definitely, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love a new new story that's completely new on its own. That that's really good. Let's say a girl in the fireplace or. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, when when it happens like this, I, I quite like it. Uh, it's surprising how things rhyme, even if they don't. Yeah. You know, yes. Even when they don't, even when things don't repeat, we often find ourselves mm. with the loosest of connections, and then, and then suddenly you think, "Hang on, there's a lot more here. These things have in common, or they speak to each other in different ways." So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.